Kurtz Movie Lock Tape 10 Day July 25th 1980 Dressed to Kill Review First and foremost Tape 10 everybody Wow I can't believe it Seems just yesterday we filmed Tape 1 I, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate ourselves with uh, moving from one digit realm to a two digit one. That's one small step for a man, one undeniable standstill f for mankind. Nonetheless, it's a milestone and we're gonna celebrate it as well as the future ones for years to come. Because when where I'm from, people believe that hard work and Patience always pays off. Where I'm from, people believe in following their dreams. Where, where I'm from, people believe in... Thank you, Steve. That was a lovely speech. Okay, Dress to Kill is a thriller film. It's not a slasher. It never looked like a slasher. It never felt like a slasher. It never was a slasher. I know that nowadays, and by that I mean year 1980, slashers become more and more popular. But that doesn't mean you have to stick that tag on every damn thriller you see. There are lots of thriller subgenres. We have spy thrillers techno thriller, political thriller, erotic thriller, revenge thriller, psychological thriller and more. What kind of thriller is dressed to kill? Oh, you'll know. By minute 3 when main character's bush is gonna be all you see for some time, you'll know. And now it's time to test your movie genre knowledge with a game show called Thrisher or Slaller. The rules are simple, you're gonna hear the premise and determine whether it's a thriller or a slasher. And you can use the poster as a helper, hinter or whatever. Can we please have posters on the screen thank you ready set go a group of friends en route to visit a grave fall victim to a family of cannibalistic psychopaths the texas chainsaw massacre from 1974 is you're right a slasher a sex repulsed woman who was left alone in an apartment while on vacation sinks into depression and has horrific visions of rape repulsion from 1965 by roman polanski is Definitely a thriller. A struggling artist slowly goes insane and starts killing derelicts with a power drill. The Driller Killer from 1979 is... Yep, a slasher. A guy witnesses a murder attempt, learns that it's connected to an ongoing murder spree and decides to investigate, despite being targeted by the killer. Lucella dalle piume di cristal Or The Bird with the Crystal Plumage from 1970 by Dario Argento is... Absolutely, a thriller. A serial killer murders women using a portable movie camera to film their dying expressions of terror. Peepin' Tom from 1960 is... Correct, a thriller. A masked maniac violently kills apartment complex tenants with the contents of a toolbox. The Toolbox Murders from 1978 is indeed a slasher. A group of high school seniors are stalked at their prom by a masked killer seeking vengeance for the accidental death of a young girl six years earlier. Prom Night from 1980 is of course, a slasher. And the last one, a serial murderer strangling women with a necktie. Although the police have a suspect, he is the wrong man. Frenzy from 1972 by Alfred Hitchcock is certainly a thriller. Good job, you guys. And if you had trouble to answer, don't worry. It was a stupid game anyway. You won't know the genre until you watch the movie. Back to the review, and we should start with the idea. Dress to Kill is an erotic thriller, also known as sexy thriller. What? Okay, there isn't. Anyhow, thrillers are something we never had shortage of. Taxi Driver from 1976 by Martin Scorsese invites you to the world of the night. Don't Look Now from 1973 was mostly shot in Venice, one of the most beautiful cities I had a privilege to visit. Marathon Man from 1976 is so delicious visually that feels more like a three-star restaurant dessert. The Wicker Man from 1973 is the originalist film, like Ever. And Le Locataire or The Tenant from 1976 by Rowan Polanski is as messed up as it is brilliant. So when it comes to thrillers, I've become more demanding. I need a fresh spin like takes place in one room or shot entirely in point of view or the killer was a dinosaur all along. In this case, Dress to Kill is quite simple but not hopeless. Why so? Because it was directed by Brian De Palma and not your dishwasher. He brought us Sisters from 1972. Carrie from 1976 and The Fury from 1978. However, he is not my type of director. I always doze off during his movies, except for a couple of them, including this one. Moving on to the plot, which is gonna be spoiled a lot. 
poetry. This film is a real roller coaster. It goes from positives to negatives to sudden what the f moments and back to positives again. And just as a real roller coaster, you love it, you hate it, but you're never bored with the ride. First upside is movie doesn't tire you with dialogue. Show don't tell people. There are multiple scenes where no one's talking for up to 10 minutes. I worship that kind of filmmaking. But when they start talking, you realize the dialogue is great. Ha! Two for two. First downside is not every check of gun fired. The scene where a woman learns that her sex mate has STDs goes absolutely nowhere. As for WTF moments, there are plenty. The opening scene, museum cat and mouth game, whatever was happening in that cab. Another positive is the killer identity. If you read the little hints the film gives you, you'll know, but leave the theater satisfied. Another negative, and for some it could be a deal breaker, myself included, is that the movie follows Psycho's footsteps with such precision that ends up walking its trail half of the time. Psycho and Dressed to Kill both have. An unhappy female protagonist that goes to unfamiliar location and suddenly gets killed with a sharp object in claustrophobic surroundings by a man dressed as a woman early in the picture. It's not an homage if half of your film is someone else's film. Now that we're done with Psycho similarities, let's talk Carrie similarities. The ending. Same it was a dream plot twist, same waking up in bed, same menace in bells music, basically the same scene. What's undoubtable is that Dress to Kill is the perfect title for this movie. Because a man dresses as a woman to kill and it's also a saying. Now it is time to talk acting. Which is the best job in the world? You dress up, pretend you're someone else and get paid for it. The Marion Crane of this movie wasn't convincing in dying, having sex or even being naked. Little buddy double pun for you. Her son did a much better job. And by the way, he was into electronics for a reason. Therefore, the fire check of gun. The detective was funny. Too bad he had little screen time. Michael Caine was fooling Michael Caine. Except for a few times when he was Michelle Kane. And Nancy Allen was great. She was believable, she was sexy. I think we're gonna hear that name again. Next up is the visuals. Three words, long takes. They embellish the film, they glue your eyes to the screen, they are something you don't see in my videos. Also editing, scenes where a woman remembers that she lost a glove and pennies. And a ring. How she managed to get this far in a movie is a f***ing mystery. But all is not as smooth as you'd want it to be. Every scene that's somewhat actiony falls apart. Murder attempt in the subway looks like a bunch of high fives. Woman hit by a car door falls to the ground like from a bullet to the head. And elevator murder looks like puppetry. And finally the axe factor. It's not a positive or a negative, just an observation. The soundtrack reminded me of Alfred Hitchcock films. I'm not saying rip off, could pass as an homage. And now it's time to do the math. Gets 1 out of 2 for idea. Maybe I set the bar too high for thrillers. Who knows? Gets 1 out of 2 for plot. Too much psycho for a movie that is not psycho. It gets 1 out of 2 for acting. Good plus bad equals average. Gets 1 out of 2 for visuals. It would have been more if not for ifs, ends or buts. And it gets 0 out of 2 for X factor. I guess it's hard to get it since no film this year succeeded so far. Overall it gets 4 out of 10, which went not according to plan. Poetry, remember? So that's it. In the end, I want to say that this film is a perfect balance of pros and cons that in the end, probably the most forgettable and the most boring. I'd recommend it to die-hard thriller fans and people who enjoy whodunit movies. Or go ahead and revisit Psycho. So yeah, here's my review. Later!